Good morning and I hope everyone is keeping well. We are moving on to chapter six of The Hobbit today and if you are reading along that is on page 106, okay? Out of the frying pan into the fire. Bilbo had escaped the goblins but he did not know where he was. He'd lost his hood, cloak, food, pony, his buttons and his friends. He wandered on and on till the sun began to sink westwards behind the mountains. Their shadows fell across Bilbo's path and he looked back. Then he looked forward and could see only before him only ridges and slopes falling towards lowlands and plains glimped occasionally behind the trees. Good heavens, he exclaimed. I seem to have got right to the other side of the misty mountains, right to the edge of the land beyond. Where and oh, where can Van Gandalf and the dwarfs have got to? I only hope to goodness they are not still back there in the power of the goblins. He still wandered on out of the little high valley over its edge and down the slopes beyond, but all the while a very uncomfortable thought was growing inside him. He wondered whether he ought not now he had the magic ring to go back into the horrible, horrible tunnels and look for his friends. He just made up his mind that it was his duty that he must turn back and very miserable he felt about it when he heard voices. He stopped and listened. It did not sound like goblins, so he crept forward carefully. He was on a stony path, winding downwards with a rocky wall on the left hand, and on the other side the ground sloped away, and there were dells below the level of the path, overhung with bushes and low trees. In one of these dells, under the bushes, people were talking. He crept still nearer, and suddenly he saw peering between two big boulders ahead with a red hood on. It was Balin doing lookout. He could have clapped and shouted for joy, but he did not. He had still got the ring on for fear of meeting something unexpected and unpleasant and he saw that Balin was looking straight at him without noticing him. I will give them all a surprise, he thought, as he crawled into the bushes at the edge of the dell. Gandalf was arguing with the dwarfs. They were discussing all that had happened to them in the tunnels and wondering and debating what they were to do now. The dwarfs were grumbling and Gandalf was saying that they could not possibly go on with their journey, leaving Mr Baggins in the hands of the goblins without trying to find out if he was alive or dead and without trying to rescue him. After all, he is my friend, said the wizard, and not a bad little chap. I feel responsible for him. I wish to goodness you had not lost him. The dwarfs wanted to know why he had ever been brought at all why he could not stick to his friends and come along with them, and why the wizard had not chosen someone with more sense. He has been more trouble than you so far, said one, and if we have got to go back now into those abdominal tunnels to look for him, then drat him, I say. Gandalf ang answered angrily, I brought him and I don't bring things that are of no use. Either you help me to look for him, or I go and leave you here to get out of the mess as best as you can yourselves. If we can only find him again, you will thank me before all this is over. Whatever did you want to go and drop him for, Dorry? You would have dropped him, said Dorry, if a goblin had suddenly grabbed your legs from behind in the dark, tripped up your feet and kicked you in the back. Then why didn't you pick him up again? Good heavens, can you ask? Goblins fighting and biting in the dark, everybody falling over bodies and hitting one another. You nearly chopped off my head with glamdering and foreign with stabbing here, there and everywhere for Christ. All of a sudden, you gave one of your blinding flashes and we saw the goblins running back yelping. You shouted, follow me, everybody, and everybody ought to have followed. We thought everybody had, and there was no time to count, as you know quite well, till we dashed through the gate guards out of the lower door and held to skelter down here. And here we are, without the burglar, confused to Kate him. And here's the burglar, said Bilbo, stepping down into the middle of them and slipping off the ring. Bless me how they jumped. Then they shouted with surprise and delight. Gandalf was astonished as any of them, but probably more pleased than all the others. He called to Balin and told him that he fought of the lookout man who let people walk right into them like that without warning. It is a fact that Bilbo's reputation went up a little great, a very great deal with the dwarfs after this. If they had still doubted that he really was a first-class burglar, in spite of Gandalf's words, they doubted no longer. Balin was the most puzzled of all but everyone said it was a very clever bit of work. Indeed, Bilbo was so pleased with their praise that he just chuckled inside and said nothing whatever about the ring. And when they asked him how he did it, he just said, oh, just crept along, you know, very carefully and quietly. 
Well, it is the first time that even a mouse has crept along carefully and quietly under my very nose and not been spotted, said Balin, and I take off my hood to you, which he did. Balin, at your service, said he. Your servant, Mr Baggins, said Bilbo. Then they wanted to know all about his adventures after they'd lost him, and he sat down and told them everything, except about the finding of the ring. Not just now, he thought. They were particularly interested in the riddle competition and shuddered most appreciatively at the, his description of Gollum. And then I couldn't think of any other question with him sitting beside me, ended Bilbo. So I said, what's in my pocket? And he couldn't guess in free go. So I said, what about your promise? Show me the way out. And he came at me to kill me and I ran and fell over and he missed me in the dark. Then I followed him because I heard him talking to himself. He thought I really knew the way out and so was making for it. And then he sat down in the entrance and I could not get by. So I jumped over him and escaped and ran down to the gate. What about the guards, they asked. Weren't there any? Oh yes, lots of them, but I dodged them. I got stuck in the door, which was only open a crack, and I lost lots of buttons, he said, sadly looking at his torn clothes. But I squeezed through all right, and here I am. The dwarfs looked at him with quite a new respect when he talked about dodging guards, jumping over Gollum and squeezing through, as if it was not very difficult or very alarming. What did I tell you, said Gandalf, laughing. Mr Baggins has more about him than you guess. He gave Bilbo a queer look from under his bushy eyebrows as he said this, and the hobbit wondered if he guessed at the part of his tale that he had left out. Then he had questions of his own to ask, for if Gandalf had explained it all by now to the dwarfs, Bilbo had not heard it. He wanted to know how the wizard had turned up again, and where they had all got to now. The wizard, to tell the truth, never minded explaining his cleverness more than once, so now he told Bilbo that both he and Eldron had been well aware of the presence of evil goblins in that part of the mountains, but their main gate used to come out on a different path, one more easy to travel by, so that they often caught people benighted near their gates. Evidently, people had given up going that way, and the goblins must have opened their new entrance at the top of the pass the dwarves had taken quite recently, because it had been found quite safe up to now. I must see if I can't find a more or less decent giant to block it up again, said Gandalf, or soon there'll be no getting over the mountains at all. As soon as Gandalf had heard Bilbo's yell, he realised what had happened. In the flash which killed the goblins that were grabbing him, he had nipped inside the crack just as if to snap to. He followed after the drivers and prisoners right to the edge of the great hall, and there he sat down and worked up the best magic he could in the shadows. A very ticklish business it was, he said, touch and go. But of course, Gandalf had made a special study of bewitchments with fire and lights. Even the Hobbit had never forgotten the magic fireworks at Old Took's Midsummer Eve parties, as you remember. The rest we all know, except that Gandalf knew all about the back door, as the goblins called the lower gate, where Bilbo lost his buttons. As a matter of fact, it was well known to anybody who was acquainted with this part of the mountains, but it took a wizard to keep his head in the tunnels and guide them in the right direction. They made that gate ages ago, he said, partly for a way of escape if they needed one, partly as a way out into the lands beyond, where they still come in the dark and do great damage. They guard it always, and no one has ever managed to block it up. They will guard it doubly after this, he laughed. All the others laughed too. After all, they'd lost a great deal, but they had killed the great goblin and a great many others besides, and they had all escaped, so that might be said to have been the best of it so far. But the wizard called them to their senses. We must be getting on at once, now that we're a little rested, he said. <clears throat> they will be out after us in hundreds when night comes on, and already shadows are lengthening. They can smell our footsteps for hours and hours after we have passed. We must be miles on before dusk. There will be a bit of moon if it keeps fine, and that is lucky. For that they mind the moon much, but it will give us a little light to steer by. Oh yes, he said in answer to more questions from the Hobbit. You lose track of time inside Goblin Tunnels. Today's Thursday, and it was Monday night or Tuesday night when we were captured. We have gone miles and miles and come right down through the heart of the mountains and are now on the other side. Quite a shortcut. But we are not at the point at which our pass would have brought us. We are too far to the north and have some awkward country ahead, and we are still pretty high up. Let's get on. 
I am dreadfully hungry, groaned Bilbo, who was suddenly aware that he had not had a meal since the night before, the night before last. Just think of that for a hobbit. His stomach felt all empty and loose and his legs all wobbly, now that the excitement was over. Can't help it, said Gandalf, unless you like to go back and ask the goblins nicely to let you have your pony back and your luggage. No, thank you, said Bilbo. Very well, then. We must just tighten our belts and trudge on. We shall be made into supper, and that will be much worse than having none ourselves. As they went on, Bilbo looked from side to side for something to eat. But the blackberries were still only in flower, and of course there was no nuts, not even hawthorn berries. He nibbled a bit of sorrel, and he drank from a small mountain stream that crossed the path, and he ate three wild strawberries that he found on its bank. But it was not much good. They still went on and on. The rough path disappeared. The bushes and the long grasses between the boulders, the patches of rabbit cropped turf, the thyme and the sage and the marjoram and the yellow rock roses all vanished, and they found themselves at the stop of a wide steep slope of fallen stones, the remains of a landslide. When they began to go down this, rubbish and small pebbles rolled away from their feet. Soon larger bits of split stone went clattering down and started other pieces below them slivering and rolling. Then lumps of rock were disturbed and bounded off, crashing down with a dust and a noise. Before long, the whole slope above them and below them seemed on the move, and they were sliding away, huddled all together in a fearful confusion of slipping, rattling, cracking slabs and stones. It was the trees at the bottom that saved them. They slid into the edge of a climbing wood of pines that here stood right up the mountain slope from the deeper, darker forests of the valleys below. Some caught hold of the trunks and swung themselves into lower branches. Some, like the little hobbit, got behind a tree to shelter from the onslaught of the rocks. Soon the danger was over, the slide had stopped, and the last faint crashes could be heard as the largest of the disturbed stones went bounding and spinning among the bracken and the pine roots far below. And I'm going to stop there today on page 114, and we'll come back to this chapter tomorrow. Take care.